morning service. <laughs>
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death. He was death on the cross. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. But a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with affliction. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the kindred valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was stabbed. 
standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He, he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fall because it was cold. Then they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if rightly, why do you have strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. <coughs> Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and 
said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I should release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, 
Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priest and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he claims to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again, and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you <coughs> and power to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From then on Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him to others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many other Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not fight the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When
when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in a place from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but us us for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other one who had been crucified with him. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once Blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of us his bones shall be broken. And another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph Ararima Fiyal, who was a disciple of Jesus, 
though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, as Pilate to take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave permission. So May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Why Good Friday? How can you possibly call this day good? It's a question we can field as clergy. And it's a great question. Just as today the uh, cross is veiled, so the good in Good Friday can be obscured from view. Even as Christians, we may struggle with today, with its shocking brutality, excruciating pain. We may avoid coming to church altogether you obviously didn't get the memo. Yet today is called Good Friday for a reason. We celebrate today's goodness. It's Godness. Today the cross may be veiled, hidden from view, yet today is a day on which the cross still shines, even if it's with a mystic glow the glow that's available from the other side of Easter. So, so why? What, why is it so difficult to perceive the cross through the veil, especially on Good Friday, God's Friday? Well, perhaps one reason is that we have trouble with our depth perception. We don't quite get the distance right between the cross and ourselves. We can look above the cross. 
We can look below the cross. We can look beyond the cross. We can look around the cross. We look everywhere else except directly at the cross. Our depth perception can get skewed. When we come into the church, we may see the stained glass before we see the cross. Stained glass that depicts stories that took place before the cross. Or stories that took place on the other side of Easter, such as the Ascension. We avoid seeing the cross, even when it is right in front of us. We have difficulty focusing on the cross in all its roughness and coarseness. You know, some of the largest churches in North America don't have a depiction of the cross at all. They don't want to put people off, offend upper middle class sensibilities. Perhaps they don't want to have to deal with Christ writhing on a Roman instrument of torture in a state-sponsored execution. Even in the church, we evade the cross of Christ. That's one reason perhaps we have trouble seeing the cross through the veil. Perhaps another reason we struggle to recognize the cross is that we are mistaken about it. We see it as something within our control, within our power to wield. Perhaps we regard it almost as a good luck charm. Have you ever seen a striker making the sign of the cross before he takes a penalty in a football match. We can confuse a cross as a talisman for success in our endeavours. You know, in the fourth century, according to the historian Eusebius, the Emperor Constantine emblazoned his military standards with the cross. He'd had a vision of a cross with the Greek words in the sign conquer before the battle of the Melvinian Bridge. And conquer in this sign, Constantine did. So another reason we may struggle to see the cross through the veil is that we misunderstand it, and therefore we, we misuse it, almost as a good luck charm in sports, business, politics. So the cross can remain obscured from our sight behind a veil because we don't want to see it. It can remain obscured from our sight because we don't recognize it for what it is. Well, today is Good Friday because it's God's Friday. How then, on God's Friday, can we see the veil see the cross through the veil? How can we recognize the cross as the fulfillment of God's plan for healing and reconciliation for all of creation, including us? We, we listen to John's sung account of Jesus' arrest, trial, torture, and execution. Now, as we reflect on these events through John's eyes, we watch them unfolding according to God's good purposes. In other words, what happens is all according to God's will. God is supremely active in these final hours of Jesus' life. God is always the prime mover in all that is going on. The arrest, the trial, the torture, and the execution of Jesus are not a series of accidents that befell him. Jesus wasn't simply in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong crowd. These events didn't overtake him as though he'd had a rough patch in life and things just went sideways. John presents Jesus 
as someone who, oddly enough, was in charge of all that was going on. Jesus functions as a master of ceremonies, even at his own arrest. The soldiers and Jewish police come across as inept. Jesus has to tell them twice that he is the one they're looking for. I am he. <clears throat> On the first occasion, they even step back and fall to the ground. Peter's clumsy. Please don't tell me it was Malchus's ear that he in intended to cut off. Jesus not only tells Peter to calm down, we learn in the other Gospels that he heals Malchus's ear. Jesus, again, is calling the shots. And when the high priest questioned Jesus about his teaching, he reminds them that he's done nothing in secret. Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. Jesus remains in the driver's seat. And when he's brought before Pilate, he chooses the questions that he will respond to. Where are you from? Pilate questions. But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate is perplexed, even scared. Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? You would know have no power over me unless it had been given you from above, Jesus responds. Jesus remains in charge. And even on the cross, he directs the beloved disciple to his mother and his mother to the beloved disciple. Women, here is your son. Here is your mother. He receives wine. And then he says, it is finished. He lays down his life. Even when Christ is most victim, most exposed to brutality, violence, and finally death, Jesus remains strangely in control. And so, it's Good Friday, it's God's Friday, because God has all matters in hand. And it's also God's Friday because from first to last, it is God's day of healing and reconciliation. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to God's self as Paul proclaims in his second letter to the church at Corinth. It's through the cross, through Jesus' perfect self-offering on that lonely hill outside Jerusalem that God restores all of creation to fellowship with God's self. And today is Good Friday, it's God's Friday, because it is today that God intervenes decisively to heal us and restore us and make us whole. On Fridays, we pray the Litany of Reconciliation out front in Bishop's Gate as a member of the community of the Cross of Nails. Now, this community is a worldwide network of some 260 churches and charities and chaplaincies and schools and agencies inspired by the story of Coventry Cathedral's destruction, rebuilding and renewing, renewal. Jesus' words from the cross, Father, forgive them, inspire the community's guiding principles of healing the wounds of history learning to live with difference and diversity, and building a culture of justice and peace. The community of the Cross of Nails seeks to embody the Cross's power 
to heal and to reconcile. Now, one Friday, Jade, not her real name, approached us. Rainbow dyed hair, long fake eyelashes, several teeth missing on one side. I immediately thought they'd been knocked out rather than having fallen out. Uh, we were gathered around a small table with a ceramic bowl filled with sand. You see, we burn the prayers our cafe guests write on pieces of paper after we've prayed them in the bowl. Jade asked what we were doing. Uh, we told her we were praying prayers of reconciliation for relationships to be restored. She told us that she'd been too angry with God to pray, at least for the past five years. We let Jade talk. It was coming up to the fifth anniversary of her, of her daughter's death, a homicide here in the city. Jade did talk about her daughter's assailant, that if she met him, she could now say, I forgive you, even if she could never forget. And that was all she said. We carried on with the litany, the set prayer. I was about to pray the prayer written by our former primate, Fred Hiltz, when someone spoke. I looked up. I wasn't expecting anyone to chime in. It was Jade. And she prayed the prayer which we pray by rote every Friday. Let us pray for all those seriously injured and traumatized and those who tend them in hospitals. Just like that. Simple, clear, unwavering. I would have said it was a prayer from Jade's heart. Today is God's Friday because it's God's day of healing and reconciliation. Through what we commemorate today, people like Jade now have another way a way out of the endless cycle of vengeance and blame and anger, a way into a new life of forgiveness and healing and peace. Somehow, the unveiled cross has opened a new door for Jade, one that she is little by little finding the courage to walk through. So both Jade and today's liturgy invite us to see the cross through the veil. Shortly, we're going to pray the solemn intercession. We'll sing a hymn of praise as we venerate the cross. We will pray prayers of reproach. Then we will come forward to grasp the cross. We'll feel the coarse texture of the wood, knowing that this is the instrument on which the Son of Man suffered and died. So may we see the cross through the veil this Good Friday. God's Friday as the day when God acts to fulfill God's purposes. God's Friday as a day of healing and reconciliation for all of creation. Today, may each of us see the cross through the veil and already shining 
with its mystic glow. In the name of God, creator, reconciler, and perfecter of life. Amen. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Let us pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Christ throughout the world for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Susan, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that the Lord will confirm God's church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth, for those, who it, for those in authority among them, for Charles, our king, and all the royal family, for Justin, the prime minister, and for the government of this country, for Doug, the premier of this province, and the members of the legislature, for Andrea, the mayor of this municipality, and for those who serve with her in the city council, for all who serve the common good. That by God's help, they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution or prejudice, for the sick, the wounded, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair. 
for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in God's mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of God's love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for all who have not heard the words of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively opposed Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples. For all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others. That God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things, are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
This is the wood of the cross, on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship.
Holy God, your Son, Jesus Christ, carried our sins in his own body on the tree so that we might have life. May we and all who remember this day find new life in him, now and in the world to come, where he lives with you in the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Almighty and eternal God, you have restored us to life by the triumphant death and resurrection of Christ. Continue this healing work within us. May we who partake of this mystery never cease to give you dedicated service. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon, bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.